Hello friends and welcome back to Archaeologists in Quarantine on Behind the Trowel. I'm your host Natasha Bilson and today we're joined with Professor Howard Williams, Archaeology Professor of Archaeology at the University of Cheshire. Chester, I don't know why I keep saying Cheshire when I was like doing advertisements today. In my mind, I think my heart belongs in Cheshire, that's why. <laughs> Well, it's nice to be here and Cheshire will do. It's uh, it's the county. Yeah. <laughs> and um, by the way, for those of you who may have a slight familiarity with the UK, it's kind of near Liverpool. It's quite close to Liverpool. So, um, yeah, that's that's where we're talking about today. Um, but honestly, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Finally, we've got to organise a date. Um, so most of you may know uh, Professor Howard Williams from uh, TikTok or Twitter, where he goes by Archeodeath. Um, and I realise both of us have a very similar T-shirt today with a similar logo. I know mine says the same. <laughs> Oh, right. OK, the dead of Riz. Well, there you are. It's obviously a theme. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Um, I remember there were some photos where half of my shirt had been cut off in some photos online and people, you know, able, they were able to fill in the gaps, put it that way. Um, ah. And I'm like, yeah, it's such a good T-shirt. Like, it's great. It's it. great. I just got this from Archeo Soup and uh, uh, another YouTube tuber. So uh, it's a, it's my on a homage to uh, Mark in on Archeo Soup. Uh, I thought I'd wear this for the occasion. <laughs> yeah, mine's a red bubble. Ah. Once, yeah, red bubble's awesome for anyone who's interested in like or who's very artistic and creative. You can put your work online, um, and others are able to buy your stuff. I know Theatre of War is uh, setting up a shop in there as well. Just Ooh. got to plug him because he is awesome. Have you seen his T-shirts? No, I haven't. No, I'm going to send you the link after this. Oh, um, thank you, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful t-shirts, beautiful artwork that he makes. Oh. Um, I love it when archaeologists make archaeology-related merchandise. It's it's niche humor slash, you know, uh, appeal, isn't it? It's good, but it's also intelligent designs. <laughs> it is, yes, yes. I like that. <laughs> so today we're going to be discussing um, memories in stone. It sounds yeah. so beautiful and somewhat like a poem, I feel. Uh, maybe this may inspire some poets in the future. Um, but um, what inspired you to even come up with that title? Because it definitely wasn't me. I'm, I'm not that. No, um, I think I stole it off another, someone else, actually. I, I, I have to double check. But one of my edited books, I think, has a paper with that title in it. I think maybe, just maybe, by Professor David Petz of Durham University now. But anyway, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, the reason I chose that really is because, well, you know, I, I've been working on a lot of different themes in the archaeology of the early Middle Ages, you know, the 5th to 11th centuries CE, AD. Um, and, and uh, you know, the theme I wanted to talk about today was inspired by the fact that I was just on TV last month on this this uh, Welsh um, um, BBC Two Wales programme called The Story of Welsh Art. And in that programme, they asked me to talk about early medieval carved stone monuments, but they called them Celtic crosses because that's what the public perhaps first think about sort of um, early medieval carved stone monuments. They think of the, the freestanding, tall, perhaps wheel-headed or circle-headed crosses, you know, that um, often inspired 19th century gravestones, 20th century war memorials. You know, that's what they think of as, of you know, early Christian art. And, and they wanted me to talk about that for that TV programme. And they really wanted me to sort of go to it. They wanted to know where to film. And <laughs> they said, oh, well, where do we go? Um, we're based in Cardiff and, you know, there's that north south divide in both England and Wales. And I said, well, there's a great site near Chester in Flint. Oh, it's a bit far. I said, OK, all right. Okay. <laughs> let's, think, let's think South Wales in the lockdown. So I suggested Margam Stones Museum, which has this wonderful collection of, of carved stone monuments. Some of them are really early, you know, 5th, 6th centuries or sub-Roman or post-Roman and they are, you know, uh, Latin inscribed stones and then some of them date to when Margam became a, a major ecclesiastical church site in the um, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries and they are amazing big bulky stones and so they filmed me there for the day um, which was a, a, a wonderfully odd experience because I never I hadn't been there for over a decade so I had to go in they'd already been filming had all their lights set up and the presenter um, was there ready to and I did my thing and I had to go I couldn't take my own pictures but I these wonderful stones were like literally listening in as I was trying to talk about them and it was a uh, uh, felt very intimidated by them because they're such wonderful pieces of of art they are early christian art the expressions of faith and and i had to really think well, what do they need as a soundbite to what do i say about these monuments to people who've never 
come across them before and, and and it's never easy and people think oh tv it's just you talk about a few just say anything and i at one level i did but another level i had to think very very carefully about what you know what are the the, the very clear messages i wanted to get people to know about these monuments so that's why I thought I'd come on here today, really, because I'm fresh from thinking and worrying about how this is going to come out on TV. I filmed last September, but it came out last month. So, <laughs> But this is a really good point that you make about how well, we try to articulate um, something that we're passionate about and how can we do it in such a concise way that explains everything that might be somewhat complex, but to a broad audience. And it definitely is a skill. Oh, well, it's a skill I haven't got yet, Tash. I mean, I've been, you know, obviously teaching for 23, 20, 21 years, but I've been teaching a while. But, you know, most, most of my students know that uh, my, my, my opening com comment is basically the 50 minute lecture. And then I'll go, oh, and here's 100 slides that I was going to get to. You know, so I, I'm not a, I'm not a very succinct person, but, uh, you know, I re I've really learned respect for the, 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 the need to, you know, the, for those that have that skill those that have that ability to to bring it distill it down to a few key points but I did my best you know <laughs> and uh, sort of I gave them a few you know sort of opening points about what you need to know about these early early medieval Celtic if you like in western Britain Anglo-Saxon in 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 eastern southern in Britain and then you know Viking age is the other term put on them and in the far north Pictish gets thrown around as a term for them but you know in other words all these different ethnic terms but they're early christian art and some of them are pre-christian but you know as a, as a generalization we're looking at sort of early early medieval period um ecclesiastical centers and the art they're producing most of which would have been in wood most of it would have been in ivory most of it would have been in other materials that don't survive it's the crosses and the carved stone monuments that survive um yeah <laughs> but they're yeah, fascinating so because from that and i don't know now yeah. Is, maybe I should ask after uh, we have a few examples for the viewers. I'm thinking maybe it might be yeah. best because otherwise they might not know what we're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, questions now. <laughs> well, I, I was going to, if I can, sh can I share screen at this point? Is that all right? Yes, because please, what I was going to. What I was going to say is that these early these early medieval carved stone monuments, like that, very few of them are in original locations, right? That's the whole problem. We archaeologists, we crave context. We need context to understand things. But the the blessing and the curse of these things is they're still many of them are still hanging around in churchyards, but not in their original locations or in churches, but knocked down, reused, and then rediscovered in the nineteenth century restoration. And most of them are just in fragments. Um, when they would have originally been much bigger and well, we, often we don't know how big they originally were. So we have a real task. So I was going to say as, as an opening, I have some slides, but I was going to say as a better opening, I wanted to share with folks uh, two websites where they can actually, um, um, you can actually uh, find out a little bit more about these. Now, the, the first one for the English material, um, let me try and share this. The f I don't know if you can see my, my other screen there now. Um, that should be... Um, the it? corpus of a, a Anglo-Saxon stone sculpture? No, maybe not. Let me have another go. You are no, sharing I screen. I see it. The corpus yeah. of Anglo-Saxon stone. Sculpture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, this is something for people to peruse in their own time. But the corpus. This is based at the University of Durham and was started by Professor Rosemary Cramp and um, Professor Richard Bailey uh, back in the late seventies. But basically, to all these churches, all these other sites where we've got bits of. Uh, 5th to 11th century stonework banging around and they've started recording it in a systematic academic way for the use of art historians, historians and archaeologists. And so you can peruse this. And I thought I'd open up on North Yorkshire Volume 6, Matam 1, <laughs> because this is right next to where you were doing your dig um, on the TV programme. So I thought I'd just show you this one and you can peruse all manner of... Um, you know, different monuments. And there's very formal descriptions and uh, formal photographs. But of course, people aren't going to look at this and really get a sense of what they're about. And um, a more recent project I was partially involved in because I suggested it, even though I didn't end up working on it, was to create a, a laser scanned uh, um, models of all of the early medieval stone monuments from the Isle of Man. And they're all on Sketchfab. And so you can peruse this in your own time. But here's uh, the um, Manx National Heritage have put all of their 
fragments of early carved stone monuments which are in churches and chapels they've put them they've laser scanned them all and this was all done with dr patricia morietta flores at lancaster university and they've all now gone on, on online on sketchfab so you can actually you know see them all and these are wonderful because on the side i don't know if you can make it out you've got a runic inscription this is one of the viking age monuments where the isle of man had a, um, a native population also scandinavian settlers converting to christianity and they've got their cr christian they are christian monuments they've got massive crosses on this fragment uh, uh, but you've got a, a runic inscription fragment down the side and um so uh, you have um new media is helping to you know, make these uh, available to folks um but i guess I, I suppose in terms of 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 thinking about them uh, and what they would have originally looked like it, it's it's really a, a challenge um uh, because very few are in their original location and so another way of introducing them is to show you this image uh, um which i hope you can see tash of of the my opening slide of the this is the pillar of elizeg uh near Llangollen in north wales and um, is this a monument you can see? Is this, um, can you um, see well, this? I can still see the sketch fab. Okay, I shall, I shall try again. Let me just uh, go on to Badoing and press another button. And with the benefits of technology, hopefully you can see that. That was my technology noise by Badoing. That was, I don't know why, why I use that, but it's just a habit. Uh, <laughs> it goes with Bing and uh, crash when things go wrong. Anyway, hopefully you can see that now, Tash. Okay, it. so this is this is a monument I've actually been involved with Bangor University excavating because it's a it doesn't look like a cross, but we think it was originally a cross. It looks like something else, but I won't go into that today. But it looks like it it, it is a fragment of a of a cross shaft uh, a column um, that would have originally risen perhaps another meter to a cross at the top uh, on on its original base on a mound. And uh, until we did excavations in 2010 to 2012, people said, oh, it's probably a Bronze Age burial mound, or could it be a, a early medieval burial mound of a king? And, and we did excavations there and proved, yep, yeah, it's a, it's a multi-phased um, second millennium BC prehistoric, therefore, Bronze Age burial mound. Yeah, we found cremation burials and inhumation burials. So we found it, that that mound was originally at least two and a half thousand years older than the Christian cross that was placed on it, probably in the reign of uh, Kungan, uh, the king of or prince of Powys, um, who was uh, reigned in the early ninth century. And he put this cross on this monument, on this ancient location, uh, perhaps to claim uh, rights to um, ancestors and rights to uh, kingship and rulership against his powerful neighbours, but the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia. So yeah, this is one of the monuments that's really interesting because it's in its original location. Sorry to interrupt, Howard. If yeah, you yeah. look into the presentation mode, um, we can actually see both. I didn't realise. Oh, can... how do I do that? I have no idea. <laughs> if I stop sharing and start again, start again yeah then that means everyone can see um the the mound with the pillow in a uh, full oh sorry there we are let's there try that one does that work i think so let me have a look to see how it looks on youtube i think so but it's fascinating what you're saying about this that's really wow i can see why you uh love this one so much yeah and it was and it's a good example of how um, these monuments, uh, they're, they're one of the major sources of information about whole areas of early medieval Britain that haven't left any other traces. Like we don't know if there was a church here where the nearest royal site was. We don't have much settlement in this particular part of North Wales, um, settlement evidence, and people aren't, um, uh, therefore this monument is reasonably in isolation. And, and the reason it's so important is not only because it's a fragment of early Christian uh, monument, um, but it has a, a, a now illegible and now invisible Latin inscription on it that tells us who put it up. And that's why we know it was put up by King Kungan to commemorate his great granddad, Elizeg. That's why it's called the Pillar of Elizeg. Um, so it's, it's actually a, a, has a Latin inscription running along this, um, this, this, uh, this cross shaft that tells us what it, why, it was, why it was erected. Um, and that's a rare thing. In fact, it's our longest early medieval Latin inscription we have on a monument rather than in a, in a manuscript. Um, and, and therefore, it's, it's almost a historical document 
as well as an archaeological site. And this is, um, I think, the second or third scheduled monument in Wales, I think, uh, or at least one of the top 10. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm not too, uh, but, you know, and, it, and it's been a protected monument for over a century, but it's never been investigated until Bangor University is Nancy Edwards and Gary Robinson and myself with the now late uh, Professor Di Morgan Evans did, did excavations over three seasons with Cadu's permission to, to try and find out about it, really. So at least this is a monument in some kind of context. <laughs> it kind of um, brings us back to the, the discussion name, you know, memories and stone. What yeah. does that tell us and what, what truth does it hide? It's so fascinating, really, when you think of a stone and the people that have even touched it, you know, and then they're yeah. going and they're carving. Oh, so... Yeah, I mean, and this is a monument that was, was intended to be a expression of Christian faith, but also a political piece of propaganda. Um, and uh, we talk about, oh, statues are just neutral history, you know, it's, you know with our whole debate today. Um, but this is intended to be an aggressive assertion against in a in, by a kingdom had powerful Welsh rivals with Gwyneth and also but also on their doorstep literally uh, only about five to ten miles away from the frontier with the powerful Mercian kingdom so they were uh, really up against it this uh, this polity in the seventh eighth and ninth centuries and they were presumably putting up this monument to say something about their themselves as a dynasty and their claims to the Roman inheritance because the Latin inscription talks about themselves as descendants of the Roman e emperor Magnus Maximus so they're trying to situate themselves as inheritors of that Roman power but also because they're trying to do something this is a, 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 a as Martin Carver would call it an argument in stone this is a monument not simply saying hey we're Christian it's saying we are inheritors of of this land of military power look at our great and you know ancestors we're trying to say something and as with the column at Massum which is about contemporary with this where you were digging you know it's an early ninth century column uh, um, in in uh, North Yorkshire these were monuments put up uh, probably in the in, in associated with nearby churches that were founded by these dynasties so the churches themselves not only as expressions of faith but they were almost engines of memory to promote the dynasties, to 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 commemorate um, the, their, their the regimes, and this is a, a relationship between secular power and faith that we find across uh, the world uh, at different times and places. Whether we're looking at um, um, me me medieval um, Southeast Asia, whether we're looking at North Africa in, in similar times, we see we we see um, you know with with the, the Viking world, with the adoption of Christianity in the 10th, 11th centuries, all the different times, different places. We see obviously the establishment of, of, of churches or temples linked to particular political dynasties as expressions and connections between faith and power in this world. So yeah, I think that's what this, this cross is all about. This, this, it's not one or the other, it's about faith and it's about power. Wow. And memory is the connector because you're trying to make those connections to sacred history and also to the story of Christ's cr crucifixion. That's what the cross is constituting. Putting it on a mound like this, is this supposed to represent Golgotha? Is this supposed to be, you know, evoking something of the Holy Land in North Wales? But also you're linking it to perhaps the idea of battle crosses, that you put a cross up on a battlefield. You know, so there's that, you know, was this a site of military victory? You know, we so we don't know for sure, but I'm just giving you some suggestions because these are the things that have been going around in my head. You know, this cross for, a, for contemporary people, people would have had those multiple connotations you know of 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 of, of warfare of of christ is the ultimate war leader that harrows hell in an early medieval mindset he's not a peaceful figure going around it, it, you know in sandals going hey guys let's get along you know he he is a, he is a war leader in the popular you know the elite of of early medieval societies modeling uh, that they're modeling themselves on you know in, in a sense so yeah it, it's it's a monument that would have had those connotations and that's not simply fantasy because we have the text we have the the context in which we see um though those representations in, in contemporary 9th 10th century society but of course we're working with fragments and that's the the curse and blessing of archaeology the fun of it all <laughs> wow i don't even have any questions because i'm just thinking now i've never thought about in the sense of propaganda when I think of coins and minting I think of propaganda yeah you know, what yeah. are the messages but nev I never really thought about that in the sense of of when I was you know standing in front of this this column 
You know? Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things where actually, you know, the pillar of Elise is a good example because it, it's, it's frustrating because it doesn't look like a cross anymore. It's not lost its cross head and we don't know where that is. It disappeared. It was pulled down or fell down in the early 17th century. And uh, one idea is that Puritans may have pulled it down in the many most of our early medieval monuments got knocked down by the Normans or um, in the 16th or 17th centuries by iconoclasts who didn't like Catholic things um, and crosses everywhere. And this may have actually been pulled down, but then maybe the cross was taken away and put in a wall somewhere as an ornament. You know, we, the, these monuments get bashed around quite a lot, but we, we it, and therefore it doesn't have, you know, spark our imagination as much as a Christian monument because it's lost its crosshead. And yet I think it would be seen in its time. And in fact, the whole valley by the 13th century, when the Cistercian monks came to the valley, they called it the Valley of the Cross, the Valley Crucis. So the nearby abbey that was founded in the 13th century by the Cistercians was called the Valley of the Cross, Glynagroes. So this, this cross survived through the Middle Ages. Now, after people had long forgotten who raised it and why, it survived as a ancient cross. In fact, in the 15th century poem um, written at Valley Cruces, it's called the, the Old Cross of Yarl. This is the upland district of Yale that gives its name to the university in the States because of a very dodgy slave owner of the 17th century, um, um, Eli Yale, who's in the churchyard at uh, Wrexham down the road. But that's another story. Uh, but the, the up, upland district of, of Yarl or Yale is um, this cross was almost like giving its name to the whole district. It was so famous by the, the 13th, 14th, 15th century centuries so that's the other thing I find really fascinating about these stones is they don't go away well they can be knocked down but but they do have enduring afterlife so um, this monument is a rare example that survived for a you know 1200 years above ground um, knocked about pulled down in the 17th century re put up put up again and there's a whole story I could tell you about why it was put up and then we we have it um, becoming an ancient monument that's part of the tourist trail so this was on the first tourist routes for German French uh, visitors in the late 18th 19th century and English tourists during the Napoleonic Wars when they couldn't go ab abroad you can waltz off to Italy they would come to North Wales and so the Pillar of Elizeg and Valley Cruces Abbey are part of our first tourist sites really and um, so they've had there's many layers to the history of this particular you know fragmentary monument and yeah question, so the main interpretation for it being a cross is because of the documents or have they found the parts that are not there anymore? No, we haven't found the parts. We hoped when we were doing our dig that we would uh, we would perhaps come across uh, some of the uh, um, the other the other um, the other bits, uh, but no, we didn't. So we've only got uh, maybe defaced. Has it been defaced? Do you think or? Um, and it's been worn by the weather, but it, 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 whether it, it probably broke when it fell. Now, the, it could have been an earthquake because we do have earthquake, earthquakes in the UK, but, you know, not perhaps as uh, well known about, but they do, we do get shudders and that could have knocked it down. But it, it, it could also have been pulled down. We don't have a record of why and when exactly. But by the early 17th century, it was it was down and in fragments at the bottom of the, the mound. And then it was restored by the local squire. Trevor Floyd, who saw himself as an ancestor of the Kings of Powers, and he re-erected it. Like any good 18th century landowner, he re-inscribed it on the other side with a text that's bigger and in Latin than the original, you know, like a modern sort of, I don't know, like a modern sort of blue plaque or, you know, something that's been restored by the Heritage Lottery Fund. The plaque is often more impressive than the actual original, you know, monument. You know, it's bigger and more, brand, uh, you know, and he did the same thing. So he made it into a monument for himself, for a, almost like an ornament for his 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 lo his local uh, um, lodge that he put in the ruins of Valley Cruces Abbey. So it has a has a has a story to it. But no, we don't know if it was a. You know, uh, broken up in the early Middle Ages, but by the 17th century, yeah, it had been knocked about. Wow, I'm intrigued. What what other examples do you have for us? Well, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, the, the monuments take so many different forms. I was going to talk about hogback stones very briefly. These, this is another category, and these are different because these aren't freestanding crosses. This is a distribution map of hogback stones, and this is so I've done a few articles about these, and they're found. Uh, they're not big freestanding crosses. They're recumbent stone monuments of the 10th 
or early 11th centuries. And they've intrigued a lot of people. And Jim Lang in 1984 called them Viking colonial monuments because we find them in areas, as I'll just flip back to that map, where we have evidence of Hiberno North and Danish settlement in the 10th and 11th centuries at northern British, so southern Scotland, northern England um, distribution, a few outliers up as far as Orkney and uh, one down in Cornwall, which no one really can get their heads around, one in Winchester. Um, but but we, we they're really odd, strange monuments. And I suppose this is another example of the kind of things we have to deal with, because these are these may have once been vividly painted, vividly, um, you know, would have been contextualised with other monuments in a setting that's now gone. And we just find them a lot of them were discovered in the 19th century, such as at Brompton in North Yorkshire. We have these wonderful, perhaps the best and most famous, every book on the Vikings will have a picture of the Brompton hogbacks. And um, we don't know how they originally looked. They, they are actually quite small. That's a radiator, sort of a, an early night, you know, sort of a 20th century radiator. But to give you, and, and they're really intriguing because what they are, as you can see, is, is bears uh, literally hogging, you know, grabbing, grasping at. Uh, architecture. They're, they're like a halls or shrines. Um, and they, 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 they're called hogbacks simply because they have curved backs like a pig, which is totally confusing for everyone. So there's nothing to do with hogs at all. They're just called hogbacks, like a, a sloping hill is called a hogback because they have a, 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 a sort of curved ridge. But the reason they're that is because they're probably emulating Viking period Christian shrines, reliquies, and halls and churches, all of which would have been built in that Trelleborg style, uh, bow walled and bow roofed style. But they've got bears hugging at them, and these bears are muzzled. And in some cases, and not all of this is recorded, but I've seen it on on their 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 forearms. They are um, they're bound. So these are bears that are obviously the most anthropomorphic, most aggressive of, of northern European animals, um, you know, omnivorous, protective. They can have lots of Christian symbolism as well as pagan symbolism. They can be seen as to do with, you know, warrior status. We have the Norse tradition of bear warrior names um, and the Anglo-Saxon tradition of this as well with bear wolf, whose name means literally wolf of the bees, which is a bear, uh, a, a, a wolf that goes after bees is a, is a, is a honey loving bear. So less Winnie the Pooh and more something a bit more aggressive. Um, but we also have that northern tradition, that that uh, that Norse tradition. But we also have Christian traditions of the bear as a nurturing um, uh, beast that would protect its young and actually lick its young to life. That that legend that comes from the classical uh, inheritance. So we have these different connotations of bears. But here we have these quite massive beasts, sort of like clinging on, almost protecting. These, these shrines. And we think they would have originally been associated with small crosses. So they look a bit pagan, but they actually would have had crosses perhaps framing them. And, and, and some of them don't have bears, but they have scenes of, of combat between people and serpents along their sides. And they have, so they, they look more like Christian monuments. But, and, and this is one of the, the bound beasts from Brompton. You can see its muzzle across um, there. And I think you've got an original wristband across its forearm. So this is what you're representing, a very aggressive animal, but one that's tamed, one that you might have even had in your aristocrat's hall as a, as a, as a guardian, as something that would look after your treasure and eat your prisoners for you, <laughs> regular, you know, whatever, or you'd have games with, you know, that this would be a, an animal of the hall. Um, so this, these are really cool objects. Of course, we don't know how they were originally arranged, but I think this one at Brompton uh, 24, it's, it's almost holding on to its own muzzle, very much like um, some of these early Christian reliquies are strapped along their roof. So this is a little shrine shaped, house shaped reliquy. And I think the, the hogbacks are doing something similar. They're almost latching themselves on to their own noses to sort of, you know. Sorry, um, yeah. that's brilliant what you're saying. We just have a question from Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, and they've asked what type of stone was usually used to create in these memorials and how yeah. to carve them? So in West, some we it depends on where you are in Britain. Most of the time, they're looking. Look, you're looking at local sandstones, um, so they're not going very far for their carved stone. Um, but some ev there's some evidence that they are when they need to to get the finest stone. Even in the early Middle Ages, they are moving stones 10, 20 miles. Um, in Western Britain, particularly Southwest Britain, they're having to use granite, and the stonework is 
much cruder because they're working in such hard materials. But usually um, you're looking at sandstones, mudstones, um, reasonably workable materials, but often materials locally available. Although sometimes they seem to be reusing Roman masonry. And so when we're up near Hadrian's Wall and near Roman sites, they're more than happy to recarve, you know, existing stonework. Wow. And by the way, for our viewers at home, if this is your first time on Behind the Trowel, these live streams are interactive. So if you have a question, head over to the live chat box and enter your question there and we'll be able to ask Professor Williams then if we have time to answer them all, that is, because I feel this is going to be so intriguing. It's going to be hard to keep this. <laughs> within a well, time I thought this would be a good case study of because they're recumbent. These aren't big grand crosses in the landscape. These are ones that perhaps would have been in churchyards and would have been covering tombs, but we haven't found any over graves there's a few antiquarian records telling us they found it over a skeleton but that you know i i don't know where these originally were most of these were reused later into the stonework of churches and and, and then found but i think their their symbolism is all about protecting the dead i think and that's what i think the the, the bears are all about they are kind of aggressive bears but friendly to bears depending on who you were and like uh, the serpents that wrap around uh, some of the rune stones of the 11th and 12th centuries in Scandinavia, these are supposed to be intimidating, scary beasts. They are almost representations of demonic forces, but they're bound into subservience. You know, they're bound into into place. And so I think that's what the bears are all about. They're not cuddly, but they're not. Neither are they evil. They are they are potentially threatening, but defending force. And the point I've made in a recent article is actually these kind of bear like shrines probably represent links to a whole host of wooden structures in, in the Viking world and metal work and, and other materials of different scales we've we've often lost so halls ships boathouses tents caskets amulets even the pommels of swords and, and and combs all have that bow shaped form they all look different i'm not saying they're all the same all i mean is that if you're living in the 10th 11th centuries and you came across a hogback stone you would see something unlike everything else but something that would you'd understand is about power protection authority faith you know um and you link those things together um and so so i i think this is part of a world where people aren't thinking about stones separately they would have understood that what they're looking at is a particular shape a particular form that is powerful and indeed we have little end beasts that are very much like miniature um um, hogbacks on striker lights for example this is one from southern Denmark um, so you have this kind of idea of beasts grappling and, and in, in, in Viking period art all the time both in a pre-Christian and a Christian context so I think it would have been a common theme in aristocratic culture across the Viking world yeah, so we, we, I suppose the point I want to make there is that to understand these stones, we have to put them in a broader context of Christian art and uh, secular art as well, of all the different things that were being used at different scales from buildings down to portable objects. And I think that's what is the, the real fascinating thing about this, this stonework. Uh, I'll give you another example. This is the, the Hesham or Hesham hogback where the, the, the bears are re reduced in size. They're almost like scary little ducks here. <laughs> They're not particularly intimidating beasts. This is two views of the same monument. But what's really interesting to add another dimension here is that you've got these seams along the side. And there's been huge debates about how we interpret these scenes. And some have long suggested since um, W.G. Collingwood's work that we're looking at um, perhaps representations of saga literature, nor sagas, and could this be uh, uh, examples of, the, of, of versions of the story of Sigmund and his son Sigurd uh, from the Volsunga saga uh, um, that, that, that make an appearance here centuries before they're written down in, in, in Iceland. Here we have them, here we have an early version of those stories circulating the Viking world, heroic stories of of, 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 of dragon slaying warriors, but put onto stones. And, and uh, you, you could think, and there has been a lot of debate about, well, how, why would you as a Christian, you know, ecclesiastical center like Hesham on the, on the Lancashire coast, why would you indulge these kind of pagan stories? And I, I would say, well, the point is really, they're not pagan so much as heroic. Um, and, and if you're commemorating the local lords, 
you may want to, uh, you know, honour their memory in, in, in their tombs by likening them to dragon slaying heroes and that you're making that connection to the story and that in a Christian context that would be okay in that particular time. <laughs> it's not that oh we're compromising or we're hedging our bets, it's no yeah, we've accepted Christianity but we're using these tombs to express our stories and our origins. So there's so many, I, I, I suppose I want to enthuse to, to viewers that there's so many different um, subways we get we, we explore these stones uh, looking at the context where they're found but even when we don't have a context this was found in a churchyard and it's just been banging around the churchyard for two centuries so we, we really don't know too much about where it was originally positioned but we can still say things about the the art itself. Do you find that this is the main issue within these sort of stone carvings is that they are not in situ so to speak they're not in yeah. the original location and I'm guessing anyway, at some point in time, maybe they've moved it on purpose and put it into another location like with floor tiles. Well, yeah, I mean, the Pillar of Elysee is a good example, but it's almost in its original. It's broken, it's fragmentary, but it is on the barrow where we think it's always been, which is really, really rare. Um, and yeah, almost all of them, because I suppose the other point to get across to them is they look hefty. They look like you can't move them. But as we've heard from prehistoric recent news stories from Mike Parker Pierce and et al's work on, on the Stonehenge, monument and its possible predecessor in Wales stones move and people are will if they're willing and keen to they will lug these things around you could certainly put one of these in a ship if you wanted to in the 9th or 10th century um, and, and, and transport it so I'm not saying they were literally throwing them over in a, in a backpack over their shoulder but I am saying that these monuments both in their time and subsequently would have been uh, uh, almost like artifacts, they're portable in a sense. Um, and I suppose one of the ideas of having a protective tomb cover is that anxiety about the grave, that the grave may not rest easily and the enemies may rob it or desecrate it, or you want to protect it out of respect. And, and that uh, graves always ev evoke that sort of nervousness about we want to make it physically permanent and fixed, yet we know these things might move around. So having a big heavy stone makes it, you know, fixes that space and that place within a churchyard, but um, it doesn't guarantee it. So, yeah, I think these things, um, uh, there's a lot of work suggesting that these these tombs that were built in the 10th century may have already been you know decommissioned and reused in 12th century norman architecture so it, di it didn't always wait until after the reformation people were quite happy to go okay no one knows about no one cares about them anymore and and with the norman regime taking over in the late 11th century that may have been a point of of, of, of dislocation where a lot of land ownership is being taken away from the anglo-scandinavian lords and these tombs may be just reuse, dump, you know, use, respect them in a sense, but let's put them, build them into the church rather than actually respect those graves. Brilliant. We did have a question um, from Emily. Thank you for your question. Um, and they were just asking, how did they carve stone in those days? What sorts of tools would they have used? Right. Well, we do know that they were using very simple um, hammer, hammer and chisel. Um, and we, we also know that they're um, almost well, we, don't, we, we think we know that no one's spending no one's a specialist stonemason who's spending all their time doing this. A lot of this is despite us trying to talk about it as sophisticated and inspired by monuments all over Europe, actually. Uh, there's a lot of connections. That's the other point. But, but they, they are very relatively crude and unsophisticated. And, and we've got to be careful about being too much value judgment here. Uh, so, you know, but from a, from a 12th, 13th, 14th century perspective, these are a bit rubbish. <laughs> uh, but the point would be, it's not because they were unaccomplished. These probably, the carvers of these 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 tombs, we don't know whether they were men, women, they may have, a lot of them may have been uh, monks and nuns who probably worked in other materials too and so that they wouldn't they wouldn't be specialists but they would have been working on these these monuments perhaps only occasionally perhaps uh, only once in a in a lifetime to honor a particular family individual and certainly um, that's another interesting point if they're in a christian ecclesiastical context they may be people who are working in metal and in in, in wood 
and um, they may have been using templates they were taking from other materials. And one of the things we do find is that a lot of the big crosses seem to be inspired by metalwork and, and manuscripts, um, carpet pages. So they're, they're taking ideas from other media. So we think they are working with ideas across media. They're not, they're not sort of like Renaissance artists. I am only, I only carve, you know, <laughs> that's all I will do. I will sit here eating whatever I eat and I only, only come out of the, my hall <laughs> when I get a commission or something when, you know, it's not like that. No, we're looking at artisans who are working possibly at ecclesiastical centers, possibly moving around, working for different lords and making bespoke monuments. And there's no two alike. So we are looking at a time when every cross, every tomb is a, is a unique monument. There's no mass production. So very simple. But I think part of that is because the, the mode of production is relatively, you know, geared to circumstance. Who wants what, when and where did they get the idea for it? Wow. By the way, for our viewers at home, if this is your first time again on Behind the Trowel, you can watch this at your own time after the live stream is over. Don't forget to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And also, this is a special live stream. We do have a petition that is going right now, which is in the description below. If you have a few seconds, please click on that and sign the petition to help um, colleagues at the University of Chester, including Professor Howard Williams here, who, whose jobs are under threat. So we do need to work as a collective to get this done. Let's show social media in, in a positive way. Um, so yeah, brilliant. If you're enjoying this, please also write after this video is over, put in the comment section how awesome this lecture is by Professor Williams. That will all be appreciated. Oh. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tash. I forgot all about that. I was getting so enthused by Viking hot no, it's right. We'll come back to <laughs> a bit later on, don't worry, but let's keep going on with this yeah. amazing lecture that you're giving us. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry it turned, I, as I get over enthusiastic, I'm sorry it went a bit lectury, but no, I mean, I suppose that's just one area I've been working in. A number of other scholars, it's not just my area. A lot of, a lot of amazing work has been done by other scholars on, on this material. And, um, you know, we had a new, new site was excavated at Workington in Cumbria, where they did find a new fragment of Hogback. This is Oxford Archaeology North. So it, it, when I say all this stuff is just bashing around since the 19th century, well, we are occasionally finding in proper modern style excavations, new fragments. They are still fragments, but they are from um, early medieval sites. So as with the fun of archaeology, we are still discovering new information and new new examples but also um laser scanning and and, and photogrammetry and these are examples from one of my students work roger lang who did uh new photogrammetry of the hesham monument um, i i think it brings out features that i hadn't seen before so i'm going to be right I, I aim to write a paper about this monument because i think i've obviously seen it in the flesh so in in the stone uh, and i've looked at it a number of times but you know, seeing this photogrammetry, this new technique of recording, uh, it really helps to bring out things that you can't necessarily see, even in a well-lit church. So it's a, it's a fascinating monument. Yeah. <laughs> it really is, just looking at the, what there is depicted on here. Oh, yeah. I mean, we don't know. So the, the Oran's position is the, the early Christian prayer position. And yet also the, in the Volsung saga, you have the sons of uh, Sig uh, Sigmund have, um, are all eaten by wolves <laughs> um, and, and they escape um, um, you know, from wolves. Uh, but then there's also a deer in the middle of this. So this is almost like a bit of a weird hunting scene. So these human figures look prone and, and under threat. And, or are they in prayer? Um, with wolves attacking them, which could be simultaneously an allusion to uh, various Christian uh, um, conceptions of the soul in peril, <laughs> in you know awaiting salvation. You know, be, the wolf here potentially being a metaphor for demonic or forces, or uh, uh, you know, or but then they've put a, a stag in the middle of it. So we don't honestly know. This doesn't make any sense in terms of either biblical stories or the later saga and while people try to shoehorn it it honestly Tash it doesn't make fully sense on the other side you have a single figure with a horse and a tree and a birds and this has been argued there's a big bird that's a very crude or chicken or something uh, yeah I know it's not easy to see uh, but but um one argument is that this is a representation of Sigurd the dragon slayer who is actually 
um, being told because he roasts the heart of the dragon Fafnir and learns the speech of birds and is warned that his foster father Regan is going to kill him. Um, mm, anyway, it's a long story, but there's a lot of family feuding going on here. But then there's also been the argument um, that this this bit of stonework looks like a serpent itself. And is he stabbing the serpent here with his hands up? I'm not convinced by that. But but, you know, my point is there's there's. There's the possibility that this doesn't, not every representation on a cross has to be a, bi a biblical story. There's something else going on here, and we're not really sure what it is. And the idea that it could come from a, a story, an earlier version of a story written down centuries later in, in, in the Norse world, isn't implausible. In fact, I can give you another example of that if you'd like. Go on then. <laughs> okay. Let's sk I'll skip through a few more hogbacks. You don't need all that. More hogbacks. Okay, so has anyone here on my on this live chat heard the story of Waylon the Smith? Well, the story of Waylon the Smith comes down to us from various medieval stories, um, and also from the earliest version is from the poetic Edda, um, uh, the 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 Lay of Voland in the Norse tradition. He's Volander the Smith, uh, but in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, he's Waylon the Smith. And the only reason we really know. Um, the story of Wayland is known in Anglo-Saxon England before, um, you know, the Viking Age. There's a few poetic references. The poem Beowulf mentions that he has a Beowulf has a male shirt of Wayland made, you know, made of a quality that the magical smith Wayland may have made it, or is it a Wayland's actual object? But we have a, an eighth century um, a whalebone casket in the British Museum called the Frank's Casket, um, which has a representation um, of the story of Wayland the Smith. But we also have these 10th century Yorkshire crosses that have this motif on it, which has long been established as showing a, 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 a representation of Wayland the Smith, who is crippled and imprisoned on an island by a, an evil King Nidad and made to make jewels for the king alone. And Wayland gets his revenge. He's not a nice guy. OK, this is not a nice, homely story. He gets his revenge on the king by seducing, uh, with hand scare quotes, the king's daughter. And therefore, the revenge takes the form of a, the king having a grandson, not of his bloodline, but from Wayland. And killing, slaying the king's sons and turning their skulls into goblets, and their eyes into brooches and so on. So he he murders the offspring of the king and gives them back as gifts to the king. And and we think these scenes, and this is from uh, Jim Lang's work, this is from a Gotlandic picture stone, but these other scenes from Yorkshire are a rare example of a Germanic legend of this Wayland, this hero smith who's crippled, imprisoned, but escapes in a fly, flying machine, in a winged machine of his own making, um, having seduced the king's daughter and murdered the king's sons. And, and, and this is the Victorian stylization of the motif that you can see in the Leeds Museum, which I don't believe, because if you actually look at the original, it's a little bit more scary. Um, this is from Sherburn, and you can see that his, that's his head, that's Wayland's head, and that's Wayland's flying machine. But Wayland's flying machine is a raptor, a huge eagle that's biting the body of a woman, and his hands are holding the, the trail of her skirts and her hair. And on the, the Leeds fragment, this is in Leeds Museum, you can see his legs wrapped into his flying machine. There is tail feathers. So he's turned himself into a giant eagle or osprey or something. And he's actually in the Leeds Minster Church, St. Peter's. You can go there today. This is the, 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 the cross. This is another one of these 10th century crosses. And this is wonderful piece of artwork. And on it, you've got this scene of Wayland in his flying machine grabbing this woman. And it is, it seems to be, and this is a, uh, there will be people on here who go, oh, that's absolute speculation. We seem to be looking at a high status cross raised to commemorate an aristocratic woman, perhaps a, an abbess or perhaps a, a queen or a, certainly a, a woman of high status and note. And here she is represented with her beautiful curled hair, holding a Bible or missile. There she is. This is a close up of it. She's a Christian aristocratic woman, you know, very nice portraiture maybe we don't know her name but we can think this is a honoring in a christian context an aristocratic person living or dead right and yet they stuck on the same monument this grisly scene of wayland um the smith and there's believe beneath him are various smith's tools there's a um a tongs and a hammer and perhaps a a, a blade 
and and an anvil and block. And then I don't know if you can see this, but he's actually um, he's uh, it's damaged stone. But you can see the bill of the 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 raptor grabbing her around her waist and his hands of his flying machine grab her trails of her skirts and her long flowing locks. But also uh, she's in the midst of doing something else. She's drinking from a horn. And I can, uh, this is my attempts at art, uh, uh, photography, sorry, but uh, you can just about see the curve of a drinking horn. So this woman is doing something. She's an aristocrat. She's got long, uh, a long flowing va um, dress. She's got long hair. And this is, we find this in the iconography of 10th, 9th, 10th century Scandinavian art too. This is how aristocratic women are represented. It's a sort of stylization of high status female gendered individuals. And always when they've got horns, they're giving them to a man or another woman uh, as a she is the lady of the hall. She is giving away the gift. But here she's imbibing from the horn herself. She's knocking it back while being grabbed from behind by this raptor figure. And while it's amazing how we have still inherited this tradition, a Victorian tradition of seeing this as almost a, 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 a Superman moment, romantically carrying off the king's daughter, I cannot help but imagine this is actually not the way this scene was intended to be understood in the early middle ages that what you've actually got on a monument that's maybe actually commemorating a godly idealized representation of a high status woman a violent aggressive attack scene to put it mildly in which the this raptor this man who's turned himself into a uh, into a, into a machine he is a early medieval iron man He's a, but he's hardly a, a he has the ego of, but not the the charisma of the Marvel superhero. Um, and and he is actually attacking from and, and almost like pinning this woman in, in the most aggressive manner possible. And you can see the hand here grabbing her hair from behind. So this is quite horrible. <laughs> and I think it was intended to be seen as horrible. And um, as a this is what happens when bad kinship kingship um is revenge Re vengeance is, is shown upon bad kingship and 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 what happens to the offspring of those individuals which seems to be crazy to a modern mindset that you'd want to show that on a monument commemorating a, a, a woman of high status and yet we have this again and again in early medieval art where it's not a, impossible to show the devil to show heroes but their fate their doomed fate and that that dark side and this is the hand grabbing her her, her trails of her dress here and uh, this is the best this is the best light where you can see her drinking from the drinking horn so this is a pretty sinister uh, representation on early medieval art that has been perhaps a uh, shall we say uh sanitized by Victorian clerics who started writing about these monuments and it's amazing how often we we, we don't talk about the more sinister um, side of these these stones or the, the stories not the sinister side of the stones but the stories upon them have uh, would have had powerful and I think they're intended to be emotive they're intended to almost you know terrify the viewer or at least uh evoke emotions in the viewer it's not it's not supposed to be comfortable spaces um, you know in the modern sense of the term you're supposed to be jarred out of your comfort zone by the the mor morality narratives of these these stones that's definitely the, the idea of morality i do feel when we do think of medieval art we do see you see everything really yep. all characters of a person the, the, the animal inside and, and the spiritual, you know, you do see that and they do find a way of showing it and scaring the people maybe. Um, yeah. And the legends that they try to invoke from the artwork. But it's so fascinating that um, people are able to even study this and look deeper into the iconography that's you know inscribed somewhere i confess i've still got to write this up and it's a very sensitive subject about how i talk about it in an academic context um because but, but there's also this long tradition of 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 not engaging with some of these more darker themes because of the the language we then have to use to 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 articulate that um and i think we but we have to be the you know the early you know looking into the past is not is is, is has to, we have to contend with some of these more sort of um un, 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 unsettling images and we and as archaeologists we don't just say oh that's my reading of this one stone we build up the case so i can show you um, I haven't got a slide here. 
50, 100 me pieces of metalwork and art from across the Scandinavian world showing what normal aristocratic women are supposed to be shown as, you know, proffering drinking horns. And that helps us to understand how this particular motif would be both familiar and disconcerting to uh, the viewers. And if I don't have it in front of me here and I didn't prepare it, but if you look at the Frank's casket, they're comparing, they're juxtaposing two gift giving scenes. Uh, Wayland seducing the king's daughter and killing the king's sons is the one set of gifts, the bad gifts, the cursed gifts. And the gifts shown next to it, you can see it in the British Museum and you can Google it. You will see the adoration of the Magi, the three wise men bringing gifts to the Christ child. So the ultimate Lord being given the the, the ultimate of gifts in that worldview. Uh, so you're, you're, I think that idea is deep in, in early medieval thinking about the, uh, the juxtaposition of the, the good gift versus the bad gift or the cursed gift versus the blessed gift. And I think that, that you know, in that context, you can show quite harrowing stories, exemplar. Yeah, Morals. Um, yeah, definitely. We will put the link. I will find the link uh, from the British Museum and I'll add it into the description box after the live Thank stream. Thank you. I, I didn't think of that for this. <laughs> yeah, no, there's so many links I'm going to have to add now. Um, <laughs> so I might be messaging you after, like, what, what was that again? <laughs> That's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, and this lovely comment from Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I just love how throughout history we see change as so dramatic. When we go through changes internally, we have anxiety. Our thoughts ravage us. And it feels as if we were going to implode and then explode. What better way than to describe our feelings in such dramatic ways? Change is a monster. That's yeah. And, 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 and of course, what's really interesting about this stone is that, that Wayland is flying up the, up the cross. Um, so he's actually flying, he's, you know, so there's an almost an ascent. You always get that the art is dynamic. It looks very sort of un, unpainted and very fragmentary it looks very you know but I think you were supposed to be seeing this in starkly contrasted colors and while scholars have I, I said on the Welsh art program last month you know that these would have been vividly colored and a, a few um, scholars got in well not scholars uh, individuals got in touch with me very angry about this and said what's the evidence for that particular monument at Margam that you were standing in front of that it was painted and I said well actually that was just standing outside for a thousand years there's no paint left on it but we do have conclusive evidence from across northern Europe as with classical art early medieval art was vividly painted and 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 these these scenes these figural scenes would have been painted in whites and blacks uh, greens reds yellows they would have tr tried to look like metalwork um, you know, we don't know what, um, how the figures were, how much detail they went. And to a modern aesthetic, I think they would look quite, you know, infantile, once painted, looked quite noddy. You know, we like that aesthetic of them being clear um, and, um, and bare stone and looking old. But I think that you would have supposed to have seen this art in very vivid colours. That in itself is, is another question and a subject is of um, how we would interpret May it be marble statue that was in full color at one point. And of course, now we're so used to seeing it as a white marble statue. Um, I didn't know that these would have been painted. I think that's really fascinating. And uh, for our viewers, just look at how they've um, constructed that back up. Um, it's incredible, yeah. the pieces, and I'm guessing some sort of cement. Yeah, yes, I think that's all a bit of a 19th century. I don't know if that's 19th or early 20th century, but I mean, there's some speculative gaps. So you can see that this is all cement down the middle and they don't have the head of Wayland in this particular scene. And I think this bit is made up and added on. And I don't think they know exactly. Um, but but no, they have. Um, yeah, <laughs> these are monuments that have stories of being reconstructed and redisplayed. And they're, they're Christian heritage at one level. They are, they're, they're part of modern places of worship uh, and so going into them and looking at them is you know you have to you know pick your time and when it's open and so on and services and so on but also they're for everyone and they tell stories for everyone they're not just about a, a particular group in our society um, and and the, this particular stone of course some people call it oh it's a viking story but it's also uh, an insular story the story of Wayland was probably known across Europe um, you know, we just don't have it everywhere. It's not a ethnic group's story or a religious group story. These these stories were circulating and being told. They were oral histories. So I think um, we have uh, you know a real chance with these monuments to to engage people who may have never come across the period and uh, in really interesting ways. Uh, there's no reason why we have to you know narrow our stories down to 
the, a particular group of people. I mean, this is in the heart of Leeds, <laughs> one of our biggest cities, you know, and, uh, you know, when it's open, you can go in and see this cross and, and it's a wonderful monument. Um, but it's, 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 it's a leap of anyone's imagination, archaeologists and everyone to imagine this vividly painted, let alone as a part of a you know, focus of a procession, maybe to commemorate a saint's day or maybe to commemorate the dead. You know, it's very difficult to put all that back onto it. And it, we get into the you know, very difficult territory of trying to work out exactly how people would have understood it. But we at least can go some way to telling the stories of these fragments. Very fascinating. And again, a great comment here, Alex. Uh, yes, um, this is sort of in regards to what Sandra said as well. Um, he always finds it interesting how there's always deeper messages um, into the stone. Um, for example, how human is concurred his beast inside and become to be a real um, spiritual person, more like with the morals again, we'll talk about morality. Yeah. Um, super, super interesting. Um, and we've actually hit the hour mark. So if I try and, <laughs> I want to I learn more. <laughs> Well, I, I was going to, I mean, I, I don't know if I, have, I I can go on and on, but I was going to simply say, um, my third case study was going back to the Pillar of Elizeg, and uh, I wanted to show you the reconstruction that Dr. Aaron Watson did of the monument to remind, you know, which is speculative, of course. Um, we know it was erected before 854 when King Kungan died, and that these would have been multimedia monuments. You know, they were intended to be strikingly coloured. They would have been they had some of them had text on them, some of them had images on them. This didn't have images on, but you know, they were intended to be for all the senses. And they were in a prompt, some of them were in churches, some of them in church houses, but this one was in a prominent landmark. And Nan Professor Nancy Edwards has speculated could this be an, even a royal inauguration site? And I did a paper a few years ago in the journal Medieval Archaeology, which is I I can I, I've got a version of it available if anyone wants to read it. Well, I look at why it's located, where it is, and like all archaeology. Even if we don't know all the details of how it looked and, and, and what colour it was and who erected it and for what motive, we can still look at the landscape context. We can do landscape archaeology. So Patricia Morietta Flores and myself in, the, in 2017, we did a landscape analysis to say, why was that site so special um, in the landscape? And we, we had some ideas, but we were able to prove in, in terms of GIS analysis it's on in terms of least cost pathways. It's a really key strategic node in the landscape, and we think therefore it would have been a place of assembly where you could you could gather your you could have markets, you could have religious festivals, you could have gather your war band for battle. But it's a it's a holy site, very close to the frontier with the Mercians, and and, and therefore it, regardless of what it originally looked like, its its location was location is all everything is all i'm going to last the last kingdom everything's got to be is all but you know um but you know the, the you know, location 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 it, the, the the situation of this monument on an ancient burial mound in a side valley near key routes that's why it was important and so like all archaeology we can work from landscape from the material itself and from the the story of how that that monument changed over time. And this was a monument that was raised and in the landscape for 1200 years. So we can, we can see that story unfold. Brilliant. So we have a few questions left before okay. we wrap up. And for anyone in the audience who's watching, um, quickly send them in now, because we're gonna have to start wrapping up because you guys know we always go over the hour mark, but we're gonna try and stay <laughs> as close as possible to it. <laughs> um, so we finished with the screen, right? I can end. Yeah. Okay, let's end that. Dum, dum, dum. Second. There we go. Hello there. Nice to see you. Back. Oh, yes. Me back again. <laughs> <laughs> that was fascinating. Um, I know first off, actually, before we even get into the questions, um, you do write a lot on your blog, which I have put in below. Thank and you. also on uh, TikTok, where you make interactive <laughs> little short videos about... Trying. <laughs> trying it's such a hard it's such a different medium tiktok it um, is it is it is i'm not I, I don't think it works for me or i work for it but i think it's the more thing but i'm trying i'm enjoying it yeah <laughs> that's the thing as long as you enjoy it don't worry um you're not on instagram are you i a very humble account yes i am publicly on instagram yes um mm -hmm. but only a few followers i haven't made a deal out of it but i, I can you know, i can give you the link yeah yeah, no, because it'd be cool maybe to put those same videos from TikTok onto Instagram because it's quite a large community of archaeologists on oh, Instagram. 
I yeah. haven't really in, in looked into it much. I must admit, I just I'm just there on the low on low key with uh, just sharing a few pictures of of ancient monuments and sheep. <laughs> You'd be surprised. People love that stuff. <laughs> okay, well now I should put the videos on as well. Then yeah, I hadn't thought. Yeah, of that. you should. Why not for fun? Only for yeah. fun. Everything we do on social media has to be for our personal enjoyment first. Others, it becomes another job, and we don't exactly want to. We're exactly just be enjoying ourselves in our free time. Um, we had a great question actually. Um, and first off, shout outs. Hello to everyone who has been commenting in the chat box. Hello, Barbara, Emily, Shelby, Nigel, Anna, uh, duh, 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 uh, Bloodbath Rich. Oh, I love this comment. Um, he just wrote, oh, where did it go? I pressed the button. When you were talking about the hog, um, the hog stones. The hog backs, um, yeah. Yeah, hog backs, that's it. Uh, he made a comment of Viking trip hazards. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Sandra. Alex and um, Florida Public Archaeology Network. And actually, Yay. yeah, so Florida uh, Public Archaeology Network also asked a really interesting question. And that was, do you have the same issues with pseudoscience claiming these stone monuments were the work of ancient aliens like they do for monumental architecture in Egypt and the Americas? Okay, short answer. Um three points if i can do it firstly because they're in britain no and there's the whole point about yeah we do have some pseudo i don't don't buy the, the it's a bit simplified to say britain doesn't have pseudo archaeology we just don't have ancient aliens as much right we still have lots of crazies we have lots of early christian sort of earth mystery stuff um we have lots of it and the pillar of elise egg and some of these other monuments are part of that but really not as much it's it, it, it's a colonial thing, isn't it? It's that that racial. We can we can go and impose narratives on the rest of the world and come up with concocted p theories, but we don't do it to our own monuments. And that, but we there is stuff. It's just not ancient aliens. But yes, there is crazy stuff going on. And I've done a I did a spoof Archeo Death blog post where I, I, I with a title you can find yourself to deliberately joke about that. I called it. And I claim that the ancient, uh, that the pillar of Elise egg sitting on its mound is created by aliens as a joke in the headline. Then I had a serious post in it, but I used it as utter shameful clickbait just to see how many people <laughs> clicked on it. Um, and and it, it went, and no one got angry at me because I it was so obviously a joke. Um, and I said immediately, this is a joke and this post will now proceed to, yeah. But no, there is, I mean, when I was digging at the pillar of Elise egg, two people did come up and tell me in front of a group of visitors, I know what you're going to find. And I said, okay, what are we going to find when we dig this Bronze Age barrow? It's not Bronze Age. It was built by the, after the Battle of Chester uh, and the slain monks of Bangor on Dee, as recorded by the Venerable Bede, were all buried in the mound. And so I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's really good. So everyone stop work. We don't have to go on. We've got the answer. Thank you. And I just started packing away and they just looked utterly shocked. And I just said, oh, no, or maybe do you think we should just keep going for a couple of weeks more just to see if we do find that? And they just look really angry at me. You know, in other words, yes. I mean, I don't usually mock people who come up with things like that. But, you know, it was just in front of like literally a party of 30 visitors. So I could hardly do anything else. But no. Yeah, there is stuff like that. It's Glastonbury, you know. Um, you know, there's lots of early Christian sites that have this stuff about it, but it's nowhere near. Yeah. Mm, brilliant. And actually, there was a question that came up uh, via Instagram. And they were asking about the artistic differences between pre-Christian and Christian stone yeah. monuments, other than the actual cross. Yeah, no, this is ah, oh, no, this is a massive, massive area. I can't even begin to start answering. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to chicken out of this one. And it's not, and it's partly through ignorance because I, my brain boils and and explodes every time I try and think about this. And generally, because I can't even do this without showing you slides and stuff but yeah look so we have we have this whole issue about do we have pre-christian art in the in the british isles in these islands sorry to offend my irish college these islands right and of course we do we do have amazing pieces of pre-christian art but by the 7th 8th century we have such a massive mess of of different interactions between irish western british northern british uh, anglo-saxon art that's why we use the term another one of our many crappy terms insular art means of these islands um, and it's got it's still exposed to flowing influences from the mediterranean from central middle and western europe so there's 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 no it's all a mess of, of artistic ideas so there's no such thing as a pure pagan or pure christian art it's all just a mix-up and that's my simple answer and i'm sorry that's not really an answer at all 
No, still, it's great, thank you. <laughs> and the last question that came through from Anna uh, via YouTube, and actually, I'm going to try and find the link for this because I actually kind of know the answer to this already, having read something that you have said. Um, and it was about, there's a lot of debates around the term Anglo-Saxon at the moment, uh -huh. the dating of pre-1066 archaeology. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember there's an article, either the current archaeology or the British archaeology magazine, where you and some others actually are all giving your stance on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, fantastic I think it's brilliant I mean look, there's going to be views that divide um, yeah. and maybe in the summary again in a short short sentence <laughs> if you can um in a sentence <laughs> holy cow uh whatever I say I'll be pilloried okay yeah Anglo-Saxon I've researched this for 20 years I use the term carefully and cautiously it's one of a host of rubbish terms we have but it's one of the ones we've got now, we either uh, and my my simply I'm not I'm going beyond the sentence. My second point is proposed alternatives are as bad or worse. And so don't buy the hype that early English is somehow an, a problematic, to, uh, a free of a term free of problems. So I use it. I will continue to use it in a responsible and careful way, as I would use Pictish, Viking and all the other problematic terms we have because the early Middle Ages is a, is a terminological nomenclature mess. Um, but um, no one is pretending it's free of problems, yeah? And, uh, and so, you know, we've got to be very critical and careful, and we certainly should be as critical and careful about using early English, because that term is just ripe with problems. That's my shorthand version. It was, no, it was good. It was perfect. Um, I 100% agree uh, with what you just said there. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for participating in today's live stream. Before we go, is there anything else that you would like to add? We could talk a little bit, if you'd like, about the petition again. We have mentioned already the link is in the description below. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really want to just, I mean, I'm really, uh, uh, two quick things about the petition. Yeah, you know, so first first of April, I thought it was an April Fool's, uh, me and my colleagues got uh, at risk of redundancy notices through. Um, this has happened to other colleagues. We've, we're in a world where everyone's in, in, in flux. I'm not, you know, I'm aware that the pandemic and so much has hit so many different people in academia, we're going through tough times, but I didn't, I didn't think it would hit us because we've got such an exciting, program undergraduate archaeology combined single honors ma programs i've got half the phd students we're all working our butts off through the pandemic none of, nobody's had a holiday <laughs> no one's had a break you know we, and that's what has been absolutely crippling and so i i had sort of i was saying just before we went live that i, I had sort of 12 hours of, sort of darkest hours just thinking you know right after 12 months of slog where i've put everything into creating a youtube channel you know trying to promote my discipline trying to support colleagues going through hard times and then this has happened and then i thought no i'm just gonna we're starting a campaign we're gonna do a campaign and we're just trying to build that momentum to convince our university managers they've made a big mistake a short-term mistake because we're having a bit of a problem now but in five years time they're going to need trained archaeologists and heritage practitioners and and we have a great degree to offer so I just want my point is actually I, I don't care what happens I, if I'm out of a job or not, but I want to say I have been overwhelmed by the level of support, just the, the, the so much goodwill. And I've had basically 18 months of, you know, not just the pandemic, but of of real negativity on in my job and the social media from so many different issues, including that about the term Anglo-Saxon, um, which is a very specialist niche thing, but it's caused so much grief. Um, it's so wonderful to see the level of love and interest and support and passion for us and for the subject. And this isn't something about specifically Chester, because this is there's going to be challenges for the discipline. You know, the commercial sector is, goes up and down. Academia has its challenges. But we there's so much enthusiasm for studying the past and for responsible evidence based narratives for stories that are. And that's what I've been about through my career. And I want to keep doing that. And I'd love to keep doing that at the University of Chester if they'll allow me. And I want my colleagues to be keeping their jobs too. But, you know, I just want to say thank you for all the support. And if you find time to sign the petition, please do. Thank you so much. And I've just checked the uh, Twitter account, which is Chester, uh, Archaeology Chester. And again, the links are in the description yes. below. Thank um, you. Over 2,000 signatures so far for the petition, which is fantastic. 
yeah i mean that's in 40 48 hours or under you know yeah. and uh, i mean and i didn't see, expect that coming because i as as i also said before in the chat you know it's so easy for these things to go under the radar there's so much going on you know um and uh, I, i'm a one apart from this short break where i've loved talking about early medieval stones again something i love talking about you know i'm a, I'm a one narrator i'm campaigning now while my colleagues are, are trying to build the case and build our build our morale up again <laughs> so but this has been a lovely reprieve <laughs> again thank you all so much for joining us thank you professor williams as well for doing this thanks um, again, tash all the links um as we've been discussing during the live stream is in the description below sign the petition okay guys sign the petition <laughs> and share this video okay share it and just it goes to show just how important public engagement is it keeps the profession alive and it keeps us in work um, so thank you everyone so much. Have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you next time.